It's Friday, August 31st, 2012. I'm Alex Jones, and this is yet another original edition of Hardcore Information Warfare. It's InfoWars Nightly News, straight ahead. Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News, Fed boss Ben Bernanke and his bankster cartel may fire up the printing presses once again as he hints at yet another bailout. Then, Chinese fluoride suppliers brazenly admit their product is insecticide. Plus, Climate Depot's Mark Marino gives us an update on all the global warming hype. All this and more on the InfoWars Nightly News. Our first story tonight is a big one, quantitative easing part three. Every economist out there, there's really no debate on this, has stated that quantitative easing three or monetizing more debt, printing more greenbacks, flooding the world with dollars, both digital and physical, will spur huge inflation, maybe even hyperinflation. And just yesterday, at a speech at Jackson Hole, where they go to make these basic announcements, uh, he said that they would provide additional accommodation as needed. Well, we're coming to a fiscal cliff. We are damned if we do, by December, if they don't create the quantitative easing. And if they do, it's going to create the inflation. So if they don't, we're in trouble. If they do, we're in trouble. They have put us into a position here as a society where either they hyperinflate things with quantitative easing three, and then it's harder to buy things, it's, it, it hurts people that are on fixed incomes, or they don't do it and the whole economy shuts down even faster. But either way, this is happening because we're in a fractional reserve banking system and because we've been made totally dependent on fiat currency. And again, here is that report during his Jackson Hole speech on Thursday, Fed boss Ben Bernanke said the privately owned bankster cartel will quote, provide additional uh, policy accommodation as needed and may engage in more so-called quantitative easing. And uh, Ron Paul uh, went on uh, to say that it is gonna cause a very, very serious problem. The chickens are coming home to roost any way you cut it. Let me boil this down. The Federal Reserve promised that it would never do QE3, but now in the last year, they've been making all these hints and then having the media, the financial news beg for it, like the Federal Reserve is the savior, so the ensuing inflation can be blamed on the population begging for it. When the Federal Reserve and the private banks engineered the derivatives crisis that is, the, that is lying at the heart of this entire situation. So that's the bottom line on that, and it's huge news. We're gonna be following this very, very closely. And again, Kurt Nemo reports on that at InfoWars.com. Headline, Fed hints at third round of quantitative easing. Now let's look at the next report. This integrates with the 1.4 billion rounds of ammo purchased in the last year, the armored pillboxes, the checkpoints, the preparations for civil unrest, basically government gearing up to take over the states and the individuals that live therein. And just like you've seen the financial crises taking place in Europe. And there's a uh, article that came out in the Star Tribune in Minneapolis, St. Paul. We reported on it at Infowars.com. Military um, Minneapolis drills based around confrontation scenarios. And they even got city officials saying, this is police state. This is preparing us for martial law. It's the local police training with special operations group out of the army to take on the American people that don't like what the federal government's doing. So the feds are taking over riot control that's supposed to be under the states. They're taking over everything. And I had Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer on today, who's been a whistleblower inside the government. And he said, no, there are preparations basically for martial law in this country. Then we've got all the civilian inmate labor camp programs, the army documents for gun confiscation, re-education. This is all going on. 
This is on Army websites, and the mainstream media will not report on it. Whether it was Rome 2,000 years ago or Hitler's Germany, when the military starts getting used domestically, you're in deep trouble. Whether it's North Korea uh, or places like Venezuela today, this is really chilling what's happening. And Aaron Dykes covered that last night with the amazing videos of them practicing protecting the Federal Reserve. And I covered that. That's the real government. In 2009, when we protested the Fed, in the Fed in Dallas and Houston, Ron Paul was down in Houston. I was up in Dallas, because uh, I'm here in Austin. Most of you are north, but I'm down here near the, the ocean, down here near the uh, Gulf of Mexico, so Dallas is north for me. And it came out, the Army was there watching us like we were terrorists. The Federal Reserve is the occupational government. It's the takeover arm. And, and that's why it's all about guarding them. It's why their buildings are built like castles and fortresses. They knew all this. They knew they were going to bankrupt us. They used making us poor as a political system of control. Here's another one. Proof, shifting gears out of overt military control to chemical control, proof Chinese industrial fluoride suppliers openly list sodium fluoride as insecticide and adhesive preservative in addition to water treatment chemical. Fluoride pushing doctors and dentists who try to contaminate your water supply with fluoride are promoting their deadly agenda with a clever lie. A lie you will see obediently repeated in every fluoride push. Here's how it is reported, Mike Adams breaks down. Fluoride is a naturally occurring mineral, yeah, like cyanide, in our water. Our city's water is unfortunate enough to have a low level so we are simply adjusting the fluoride in the water to its optimum level to improve public health. This is after the federal government has said, take it out of the water. And I have read and, and shown newscast here where they admit they have Chinese fluoride, where most of it comes from. A lot of it comes from Florida as well, out of the phosphate mines. And it's got mercury, lead, hundreds of chemicals in it. And so instead of having to store toxic waste, you pay to drink it. Millions in, in a year in cities like Austin. We pay for stuff you can't pay people to take. But again, criminals hide in the bureaucracy. You know, shut down a power plant, increase prices for the company that paid you off, make you buy toxic waste, make you drink it, take uh, weapons grade uh, uranium or or DU, put it in weapon systems. So what if the troops die from it? I mean, it's just it's just pure evil. Trusting people go along with this corrupt system, and we are the mark. We are the people that the con artists are targeting. Uh, so an amazing article. Read the whole thing at naturalnews.com or infowars.com. Now let's uh, move on here. We talk about how Obama has this total CIA past at every single level. He's not the Muslim they claim he is. He's not the communist, even though he's promoting a communist agenda. His mother, his grandfather, all of them CIA. Here is an article by uh, Jurian Massan at Infowars.com. Scholar who brought Obama into college law school held top intelligence clearance. Around the time, former federal judge Michael McConnell lobbied Obama into a teaching position at Chicago Law School. He held a top military and intelligence clearance, reportedly directed uh, directly to Presidents Reagan and Bush on the legality of U.S. intelligence operations. And it goes over the whole fact. The point is, Obama is a CIA baby. But that doesn't mean he's an American baby, because the CIA represents the foreign banks. They ship the drugs in, they control the crime syndicates. Their excuse is, well, we control crime to control it. Yeah, you control crime to expand it. Look what you've done to our country. You were founded out of British intelligence, OSS, and Skull and Bones. It's disgusting. Uh, let's continue here with the next report. It is time for the Ron Paul revolution to move beyond politics. Ron Paul has said this himself. This is not about Ron Paul. He was a focal point of people not wanting to be under the left-right paradigm, but get back to rugged individualism. And so Ron Paul is not the focal point now. He's leaving Congress. Uh, I've got to be honest or I'd be lying to you. Jesse Benton and others, as we're about to cover, think that anybody who is basically libertarian or conservative is an extremist. 
and they want to wed themselves to the official Republican Party. And we've covered this. We've talked about it. We have a chilling clip um, that uh, reporters got to his credit. In fact, I want to try to get him on next week. Uh, uh, Peter Schiff, the economist uh, and, and financial advisor, uh, you know, fund manager, with the text message from Jesse Benton saying, don't go to Ron Paul Fest. 10,000 families with kids there. Ron Paul spoke at it against what people were telling him to do because he is a good guy. You know, don't go to this thing because the Republican leadership doesn't want people to talk about libertarian stuff. It is so shameful. And all he's doing is trying to corner the market on Ron Paul and tell Ron Paul what to do. And so to his credit, because remember, it was like up to the day, will Ron Paul sh show up? And Ron Paul understood, even though all his little advisors were telling him don't go, he had to go. All these people calling it Paul Fest, trying to say he should be our president. And Jesse Benton doesn't want him to be there. My God, I, Jesse Benton, you're going places. In a soulless, collapsing Rome, in a soulless, collapsing Washington, um, you know, Ron Paul was built off of his integrity and telling the truth and off people resonating with that and our small contributions. And my radio show that he admitted three and a half years ago got him half his contributions in 2008. Now, that may not mean anything to you because you get to wear suits, strut around and act tough. But I tell you what, I, you know, I was invited to Paul Fest to speak. I didn't go because I knew people like you wouldn't want me there. I stayed out of it. I, I can speak to millions every day. I don't need to go speak to 10,000. But the fact that you would see those families, you know what, I, should, I need to shut up now. I've been trying to be positive. Ron Paul and his minions are not the enemy. And I love Ron Paul, but his minions make me sick. And, and, and I tell you, why don't you go work for Mitt Romney, Jesse Benton? Well, that's coming up. Um, I'm not going to go over the whole Brandon Smith at Alt Market uh, report here, uh, but he goes over a lot of this and where, um, you know, Benton talks about the fringe elements. Yeah, we're the people that the Homeland Security report says are terrorists. We're the people that, that they say are bad because we believe in the family and freedom and decency and not being liars. We're the people that are called extremists. We're the freedom lovers. We're the liberty lovers that are called terrorists. And, uh, you know, I, I've known for several years that Jesse Benton didn't want Ron Paul on my radio show. Hey, Ron Paul got contributions and support from my show. I don't even try to get Ron Paul on or Rand Paul anymore. Ron Paul's riding off the sunset and Rand's, you know, doing his thing. Rand Paul's not my enemy. He's better than most people in the Senate. But it's sad to see you guys in love with the glitz and glamour of mainstream television and all the rest of it. Look, let me give you a little news flash. I don't even respond now when national media wants me on, okay, because I know it's all hollow. Zombies, brain deads watch that. And I'm now ranting. But you'll understand why I'm ranting, because before the show tonight, I saw these clips. And I've got to say, they are punches to the stomach. Because when you invest in somebody, you end up investing in their, in their camp followers. And you end up investing in people like Jesse Benton. And I was sitting there saying, if Ron Paul doesn't show up to Paul Fest, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to privately uh, rethink who I think that man is. And when he showed up, it was a great thing. But it was also kind of pathetic that they waited to the last minute. They didn't promote it so it wouldn't you know, overshadow the Republican convention so Rand could have his speech that nobody watched. I mean, just toadying up to a dying dinosaur Republican Democratic Party is painful. It's painful. I don't even dislike you. It's painful to hear Jesse Benton stuttering right. and, 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 you know, thinking he's this big, awesome political guru when all he did was get Ron Paul to stand down because of the, quote, intimidation of Mitt Romney we're about to cover that one of their own top campaign people has now broken ranks and talked about. And you know why they're breaking ranks and talking about it? Because they know that Jesse Benton and others, to a certain extent, got the Paul camp to sell out for 30 stinking pieces of silver. Ron Paul should have run up against Romney and exposed him. Rand Paul should have continued to be super hardcore. They should have let Romney attack him and owned it and loved it. I don't even see Mitt Romney stickers now anywhere in Texas. And this is so Republican, it'll make your head spin.
But instead, we got to listen to all the little know-it-alls that got stars in their eyes about how they're going to be big campaign managers and, you know, run the Campaign for Liberty email list and get hired for other campaigns. All you did, and it's now blowing up in your face, and it makes me sick that this is happening. I mean, when Peter Schiff's coming out because of conscious and exposing that he shouldn't be at Paul Fest, that's a big deal. Uh, when, uh, you know, other, other advisors... Uh, in her, like Doug Weed, top advisor, you know, says, I, you know, I think this is wrong. We should have gone after Romney. And it's all Jesse Benton's fault. I mean, my God, this is disgusting. All for the precious, stupid convention that's all teleprompter running a fraud. I, okay. Okay. I, I went on a week long jag about this months ago, and I'm going to stop right now. Let's just move forward for liberty and freedom. But you do have a right to see what happened. So let's go ahead and go to the Republican establishment. Mitt Romney, carbon taxes, semi-auto gun ban supporter, abortion supporter, in his real votes and real action, uh, no child left behind, uh, banker bailout, should I, I mean, I, I mean, I keep going here for a couple hours. And then to sit there and, and be told I'm supposed to worship him. Look, I get Obama's bad. But it's like going to a, you know, a, a concert and they got porta potties and they're like, well, you don't want to go in that porta potty. There's a 50, you know, things floating around. But this one only has 49. Let's go dive in that because there's a little better rhetoric from Romney. Actions speak louder than words. Like my grandfather used to say, that's what matters, what you do, the fruits of the tree. And I say this because I don't want a bunch of neocons taking over the skeletal remains of what's left of what the people built using Ron Paul as a focal point in his credibility. So good job, Ron Paul. Go into that Paul Fest, even though a bunch of nimwits were telling you not to. Dimwit twits. All right, I'm going to stop. I don't want to be mean here. just want to let the facts speak for themselves. Here is Republicans changing the rules, specifically Rule 16, where if they don't like the delegates elected, they can replace them. The vast majority clearly say, no, we don't want Romney. We want Ron Paul. But you notice the teleprompter in the second clip in live time, it already says uh, that the yeses have it. The yeas have it. Here is that clip. And then we'll get to the devastating clips with Peter Schiff and others. Here it is. The question is on the adoption of the resolution. All those in favor signify by saying aye. <laughs> Opposed, no. We need another chair. The ayes have it. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The question is on the adoption of the resolution. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Now, remember, I told Obama bots that were, bah, Obama, Obama, I told you that he was bought and paid for by the globalists and the entire agenda would continue. But they can't get open socialism under a, a Republican, so they put a Democrat in so they can take the, the, the blame. Now, they're getting ready to put Romney in because they figure a new face will con you for a few years again. And there you just saw it, the whole thing rigged. Now, this is top Ron Paul advisor Doug Weed saying the Paul campaign did not attack Romney in Michigan because Romney threatened to drop a political A-bomb on the Liberty campaign and ruin Ron Paul's name forever. Well, come on in. Throw me in that briar patch. If you've got somebody that no one will even put bumper stickers up for who's a joke, when it comes to being a constitutionalist, a libertarian, whatever. If you've got this guy over here, and then Ron Paul has been cheated in the first few states like Iowa and Maine, where he did win. I mean, I told you, the Pauls just got intimidated. They got hammered down. They had people inside their camp. I told you this at the time that told them, stand down and go along with it. And I tell you, it's a total cop-out. I mean, I would lose my integrity if I didn't tell you what I really thought about this. But here it is, Doug Weed, Mitt Romney threatened you? How about Ron Paul dropping an atomic bomb on him for abortion, carbon taxes, gun control, uh, legalizing illegal aliens? I mean, the, the list goes on and on. 
So instead, all this love affair, patty cake stuff, and they dangled out to the polls, oh, you could be Vice President Durand. Just the art of, 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 of rope-a-dope. And again, the starry-eyed, you know, little advisors married to the granddaughter. Oh, I'm going to be a big star. You're going to, I predict something. You, I mean, you, you, you'll do well with the whole Ron Paul list and all that. But, you know, the whole campaign list and, all, and the contributors. But you're not going anywhere. They, uh, they don't trust you. They don't trust somebody that, 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 that basically worked with others from inside a campaign. And again, I just got to say it. I mean, Jesse Benton is, is a disgrace. He really is a disgrace. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to shit here like a schmuck or a sucker or a dupe or a mark or an idiot and not say it. So as far as I'm concerned, Jesse Benton, uh, there aren't words to describe what you've done. Uh, in fact, speaking of that, let, let's go ahead and go to the Doug Wheat clip. And then we've got... We've got Peter Schiff uh, with the text message from uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Benton. Here it is. Disconnect was over our inability to and our dis our decision not to attack Mitt Romney going into Michigan. That's the basis of all of it. And I favored us going after Mitt Romney. I wanted to go after him <laughs> like crazy. The argument against going after Mitt Romney was that he had a tremendous amount of money. And he threatened to drop an A-bomb on us. He threatened to destroy forever the name Ron Paul by producing commercials that would, and advertising that would d destroy his name and reputation. And uh, that was the argument in favor of if he's already won the nomination, which our numbers told us he had. And again, I'm the bad guy for being upset by this. I mean, here we are learning how they basically stood down. That's just, while, give us money, give us money, and I'm like, well, we'll get the Liberty Movement's message out. And then, I've known all along, I never talked about it on air, because I don't want to infight, that Jesse Benton's like, don't go on this show, don't go on that show, you know, being overruled by Ron Paul to come on my show. When Ron Paul got a lot more out of my giant audience than I got out of him, my listenership didn't even go up when Ron Paul was on. I mean, I could go sell out and support the New World Order, to be put on 600 radio stations. I was offered that a decade ago. I, I just don't get falling down to the power structure immediately and you know begging. And here is the clip of clips. Here we have uh, you know, the uh, fund manager, Peter Schiff, to his credit, I'm gonna try to get him on next week, coming on going, yeah, here's Jesse Benton saying, don't come to Paul Fest. I mean, Paul Fest, just a bunch of families and people wanting to say, hey, we support what you say, Ron Paul. But because, oh, no, Jesse needs to be a big star uh, at, the, uh, at the RNC with all those mummies. Well, we can't. Peter, don't go to that. But Ron Paul showed up, didn't he? Didn't do a lot of promotion because they didn't want it to overshadow the precious RNC, but understood it would just turn down and make feel bad, all these people that believed in you with their starry eyes. So Ron Paul had the cake and ate it too. He didn't promote it, but he did He did show up. And I guess Jesse Benton didn't get the memo because he's like, don't you go speak at that because it's a fringe. What's the exact quote? Peter Schiff reading a text uh, he got from Jesse Benton about how the grassroots Paul Fest was fringe and the Paul campaign would not participate. Well, according to Jesse Benton, Ron Paul's fringe because he came and spoke at it. Now I wish I would have gone to see this. My God, my God, I don't like the New World Order, but my God, people in our camp that engage in this type of Machiavellian scurrying, the chickens are going to come home because your own people are not going to morally go along with this. That's all I can say. Here it is. You might want to reconsider Paul Fest. I think it's bad news. Why aren't you guys involved? I wrote them. Bad people organizing a big fringe element. You're hoping the event goes away. It's the last yeah, and that, I mean, we got a bad rap the whole way along. I mean, you know, I didn't even really follow Paul Fest very much once it launched. Uh, Peter did speak there, didn't he? Yeah, so he did speak there. So good, good for him. I mean, don't go there. Bad people, very friends, very, really, like Ron Paul. I mean, 
It was like 10,000 people, a lot of them that were poor, that traveled all over the country to go support Ron Paul. Man, I am trying my best not to go after Jesse Benton, but I tell you what, he asked for it, man. He is asking for it. Whoa! But good for Ron Paul and good for Peter Schiff. I'm done. Tell me what you think in the comments below here at Infowars.com and PrisonBunner.com. This is a major, major, major scandal in my humble opinion. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and move on from that. It is time to move beyond uh, that and what's going on. We're going to talk about this coming up with uh, Mr. Moreno of Climate Depot. Michael Mann's his lawsuit against National Review is on for saying that his hockey stick graph is uh, incorrect. So that's part of a new campaign of intimidation against the First Amendment. We're going to be discussing that more coming up uh, and some more of those important documents uh, here in my other list of news that we have uh, this evening. New blockbuster paper finds man-made CO2 is not driving global warming, published today in Global and Planetary Change, finds changes in CO2 uh, follow rather than lead global air surface temperatures. And continuing, we'll talk about this after the break, bye-bye American SUVs, Obama just killed them via EPA, who needs Congress? And accused U.S. spy crucified for placing drone sensors in Yemen. And you notice that the mainstream uh, corporate media has not covered this. Uh, that's because even though that's gruesome and I think wrong, it is a message uh, that they don't want getting out to their spies. Uh, I mean, that's what the drones are about is intimidation and fear. This is about intimidation and fear. And just like they don't want the media talking about drones killing whole villages to kill one person they claim is a terrorist, the media does not want uh, this out there. Now let's go to the quote of the day here on InfoWars Nightly News. Among the natural rights of the colonist are these. First, a right to life. Secondly, to liberty. And thirdly, to property. Together with them, the right to defend them in the best manner they can. Samuel Adams. And that's where life, liberty, pursuit of happiness came from. They thought property sounded a little too greedy. That you, you know, everybody wants to live in a commune with some globalist control freak parasite, you know, aiming machine guns at you. So that was evil uh, Sam Adams there. Uh, most people think is just the name of a beer. And then we have uh, part two as we go to break here of Dan Badondi's excellent report. He did part one last night on the history of chemical, biological, radiological testing on troops, including lethally killing them in tests. But the government's good people. I mean, they've been doing this for about 80 years and shooting people up with syphilis shots and radiating foster children and everything else. But it's nothing to worry about. Uh, this part two is on mind control, drugging of the troops uh, in experiments. So here's that. We're going to break. And then we're uh, going to come back. It also covers uh, the massive suicide uh, um, increases that tie into all the Prozac they give them that they know causes suicide. So here is our new reporter, Dan Badandi's report. Stay with us. Dan Badandi reporting for the InfoWars Nightly News. In part one of our special report, we showed you now declassified documents of our government covertly testing chemical weapons on our troops. But it took years for this information to see the light of day. And now soldiers are being deployed on multiple tours, some with missing limbs from combat injuries. So it's no wonder we are now seeing an increase in troop suicides. But don't worry, because the Pentagon has a solution. You can trust them, right? Well, here's part two of that report. Today, the DOD admits that it tested the deadly nerve agent sarin, known as VX, or biological toxins, on American servicemen, but said the information was classified. And lately, the DOD agreed to declassify all of the 113 operations and inform the Department of Veterans Affairs, known as the VA, of the findings, and presently, only 12 of the 113 have been declassified, although the information being released is very limited. And only about 600 veterans of the estimated tens of thousands of those exposed of, to warfare agents have been notified. A study by the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs completed in September of 2001, but never released to the public or the affected veterans. 
And according to USA Today, Ami's suicide rate hits an all-time high in July in one month tally. Soldiers killed themselves at a rate faster than one per day in July, the Army announced Thursday. There were 38 deaths either confirmed or suspected as suicides, the highest one-month tally in recent Army history, the service said. The Army suicide pace this year is surpassing. Last year, particularly among active duty soldiers, there is a 22% increase, 116 deaths so far this year versus 95 during the same seven month year period of last year. Now the United States Army recently came out a document titled Army Suicide Prevention Program. And in this program document, it shows two graphs. One is the active duty suicides by calendar year. And as you can see, it's a staggering increase in suicides in the military for active duty soldiers. Then we move on to the second chart that shows the increase in suicides by non-active duty suicides by calendar year. You can see the suicide issue is very alarming and only getting worse. Now the government is pushing these so-called anti-suicide poisonous nasal vaccines that chemically destroy parts of the brain. And Russia Today reports that the United States Army grants $3 million for anti-suicide nasal spray research. And the article goes on to state that for those feeling down in the dumps, the U.S. military now has a solution, an anti-suicidal nasal spray that delivers antidepressant chemicals to the brain. Yes, folks, another brain-eating vaccine. Can it be trusted? But they say the U.S. Army has awarded a scientist at the Indiana University School of Medicine $3 million to develop a nasal spray that eclipses suicidal thoughts. Dr. Michael Kubak and his research team will have three years to assert whether the nasal spray is safe or effective method of preventing suicides. The Army suicide rate is the highest level in all of history, with more American soldiers taking their own lives being killed more than by the Taliban. The Pentagon reported in June that the suicides among soldiers have averaged one per day this year, surpassing the rate of combat fatalities of last year. This is not an attack in any way on the brave men and women who served in the armed forces, but to bring awareness that parts of our government are criminals and have no care for our safety. And the bottom line is the elite hate the military, and so do high parts of our government. And Henry Kissinger made this disturbing and very disrespectful quote about the military, stating that military men are just dumb, stupid animals to be used as pawns in foreign policy. And that, my friends, is what the elite think of you. And this is Dan Bedondi for this special report on the InfoWars Nightly News. Welcome, Planet InfoWars Patriots. I'm Christy Hightower, reporting for PlanetInfoWars.com. Just a little update on what's going on on the site. Um, I just want to bring to your attention, Alex always says, you know, Planet InfoWars is for people like you to go and find fellow pa Patriots who are passionate, who, uh, you know, want to go camping, others that, you know, dating and, and all kinds of good stuff like that. Well, um, he's also said that articles are looked at and if they're well-written, well-cited, timely, all of the above, that we will put them on the featured stories on Infowars.com. Well, this week has been no exception. In fact, there's an article called The Conspiracy of an Empire, A Letter to Those That Serve the System by Infowars, Planet Infowars user Sean Helton. Um, and within hours of us finding it, we put it on Infowars.com, main featured stories, so I just want to remind you that we are looking, we are paying attention, so keep those awesome articles coming. Uh, thank you, Sean, and your partner, Nemo, for uh, writing that for us. Um, also, Alex is also saying, you know, PlanetInfoWars.com is a good place for dating. Now, the Internet can be a little tricky, you know, to find somebody you want to, you want to talk to and, and be friends with and stuff. Um, but lucky for you guys, um, Herbic07 and Lady Liberty... Uh, well, I guess not lucky for everyone, but lucky for these two. They found each other on planetinfowars.com uh, a couple weeks ago, and they just want to let us know that, uh, that they're doing well. So I wanted to ask you two, um, Herbic07 and Lady Liberty, if it all works out, which one of you is going to be moving? Because uh, one of you lives in Texas and the other one in Virginia. So <laughs> I can't imagine the commuting is all that easy. Um, well, congratulations. And then lastly, we have, uh, we have a mission every week on the infographic group. 
Um, this week, we've actually been doing uh, fluoride. And the previous weeks have been things like guns where we have um, InfoWars users send in pictures that they've designed, you know, on their Photoshop or Illustrator, or they've hand-drawn. And these are actually going to be used in all kinds of different places, um, on our Facebook, Alexander Emmerich Jones, or our Twitter, uh, Real Alex Jones. Uh, we've even started a Pinterest, Real Alex Jones, uh, where you can go and find these cool images. So those are, those are awesome. Keep those coming. And um, actually, we have been hiring new reporters here in the studio. And one of them is Melissa Melton. And she actually got started and kind of discovered, if you will, through this infographic group. So we pay attention to a lot of really cool stuff on Planet Infowars. Um, and uh, if you missed it, I'm wearing the In the Fed t-shirt, which when you see this message, the uh, sale on it, it's $11.95 on sale in the InfoWarsShop.com just for the end of the day till midnight. Now you can buy at regular price, but um, August 30th, by the end of the day, uh, midnight, it's going to be, uh, it'll go back to regular price. So get that uh, while you can and uh, be as cool as me. No, I'm just kidding. I'm teasing. Uh, so thanks for tuning in. Um, Patriots out there, y'all are talking and we're listening. So till next time. Alex Jones here with a message that could revolutionize health in this country. Going back about a year and a half ago, I began to learn about the incredible health effects of Longevity products. Aaron Dykes lost 92 pounds. We're going to show you some before and afters. Aaron, break down what happened, your story. I've worked really hard with diet and exercise to try to lose weight, but I just didn't get the results. It just didn't happen. Then I saw what you were doing with InfoWarsTeam.com. I wasn't even trying to lose weight, but I got it because I wanted to feel better energy. I wanted that nutrition. Didn't even understand how that could kickstart my own weight loss goals, but the products did that for me. I found myself suddenly losing weight, more energetic, wanting to exercise, wanting to eat the right foods. And they don't even advertise it as weight loss. I want to challenge our radio listeners to go to InfoWarsTeam.com, sign up as a distributor, and get wholesale pricing discounts at InfoWarsTeam.com. And we are back on this Friday, August 31st, 2012 edition. And Mark Moreno, a congressional advisor on uh, climate change and environmental issues, to break down the latest developments in the fight for freedom in Western civilization. Authoritarians throughout history have always packaged what they're doing as trying to save the Earth. And it always includes them controlling your resources and your life. Uh, Bill Gates uh, now wants us to use cat boxes. He's come out with a... Uh, Water-free toilet nightmare. Of course, he with all his giant 20 and 30 and 50,000 square foot, one of them's bigger than that, homes, he'll be using uh, regular toilets. Uh, but the resources, you know, he needs those as an admitted eugenicist and his dad, of course, the former head of Planned Parenthood. And uh, Mark Moreno has traveled all over the world. He's traveled to Durban, South Africa. He, he, he just got back from uh, Rio de Janeiro with their big UN event. They're losing everywhere. And so the Washington Post publication has said, oh my gosh, they're waking up to our Agenda 21. What will we do? The New York Times, they're panicking. And just today, I was talking to my reporters about cases outside Austin where activists are saying, we don't want to be under the zoning. We don't want to have you know Obama's carbon tax uh, stuff implemented. We don't want our power plant shut down. They're having lawyers send them letters threatening to sue them for saying that the UN is involved. I, I mean, this is this is scary. Threats of suits, slap suits. We're going to be talking about that. Uh, suits being filed. Uh, I mean, they do not want us to warn people about what's happening because the word is getting out and they've hit the panic button. So the last time he was on a month or so ago uh, from South America covering this, you know, I said, how are they going to come at us? And he talked about some of the new tactics. So they want to deindustrialize us, and then they control who can operate, who can live. I covered this a few weeks ago. It's going to, um, going to be my first question for Mark Moreno of ClimateDepot.com. And that's this. 
Here in Austin, they're implementing Agenda 21 just like San Francisco. Can't get Congress to do it? They're doing an end run, as Schwarzenegger said three years ago in Copenhagen. Uh, he's the guy carrying the ball. They've shut down two of our power plants. This is in the news. Power prices have doubled. City owned. Now they're shutting down the other big one the city owns. Modern, great system. Getting rid of it. And they admit it will increase prices for the select groups that get the Obama waivers. I mean, there's more than one way to rob a bank, folks. This, this is where it's happening. It's artificial scarcity, just like Enron got caught doing. And I'm living under it. I'm living under it where they're saying now when you buy a house in Austin, they've got to come do a city audit. Uh, and harass you and all this stuff. I mean, it's hellish to live under these parasites. Mark Moreno, thank God for what you're doing, but things are getting dark. You know, because we're winning the empire striking back, people should go to climatedepot.com. Uh, they should click on your sponsors. Uh, they should support the products you've got there. They've got to go to infowars.com and prisonplanet.com. You know, right now, uh, I'm not giving it attention. It's no big deal. I'll defeat it. I've been sued three times with slap suits. I defeat them. Uh, but, I mean, these people do not like free speech. And you were, uh, you know, uh, telling me before we went on air about some of the stuff happening. I want to cover that first uh, with, with National Review. I was talking to people in towns outside Austin where this stuff is happening. They really want to intimidate us. And I think the answer is beat them in court and then for their false uh, prosecution, their false civil action, go back after them. I've done that before and won. Uh, because uh, I'm not going to be bullied and pushed around. I mean, if they get away with this, my God, the sky's the limit. I mean, I know I'm ranting, uh, but uh, break down what's happening with the threats out there, and then I want to get into this shutting down power plants, one-third of them nationwide right now. Yeah, well, first of all, on the Agenda 21 thing you mentioned, right before the Rio conference, our EPA administrator, Lisa Jackson, flew to Paris for an organizational meeting with other UN de delegates to discuss how to plan a global uh, global environmental governance. Uh, so we have the head of the EPA who actively shutting down coal plants, uh, deeply steeped in the Agenda 21 process with the United Nations and sustainable development. It's a very, very scary development because the EPA, of course, is an unelected, unregulated, unaudited agency that can pretty much run roughshod over whatever they want to do, which is why the Obama administration is now enforcing global warming laws through the EPA because they couldn't get it through Congress and they couldn't get a UN treaty out of it. So, uh, and what's happened there, and you've, you've touched on that too, Alex, there's a, there's a, you could call it a thin skin, but if that's a very superficial way of looking at it, there's a, there's a strategy here to not only shut down debate, but to intimidate anyone who's a critic of the UN process and of the alleged consensus view of man-made global warming and modern environmentalism. In fact, Patrick Moore, the, 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 one of the co-founders of Greenpeace, who turned against the organization and now is one of the biggest uh, speakers against the United Nations and against climate hysteria, he is being viciously attacked every time he uh, speaks out. Uh, he has been targeted by these individuals. In addition, Michael Mann, the climate gate scientist is now going after and threatening to sue National Review and, and commentator Mark Stein uh, for eventually, essentially saying that his hockey stiff graph uh, was fraudulent and that it was proven wrong. And they're going after he's got a he hired and this is no joke the tobacco lawyer who represented Joe Camel. Now keep in mind the left is always liking to accuse conservatives of being in the pay of big tobacco and we're you know we're big tobacco. Well, here's the left. Michael Mann, ClimateGate UN scientist, hiring Joe Camel's attorney to go around and threaten National Review. And this lawsuit, the National Review's simple answer is bring it on, much like you. They believe that through the discovery process, Michael Mann will be forced to turn over many documents and correspondence that would ruin him and bury him. And so there's still, we're calling this bluffgate. Michael Mann and his lawyer have still not filed the lawsuit. Uh, and if they do, uh, it's going to be it's going to be the, one of the tr biggest trials of the modern era, particularly when it comes to, to global warming and modern environmentalism. Well, uh, what's incredible about this is we've got the climate gate emails out of uh, the university there in England where they're saying we've got to hide the decline. Uh, you've got the proof that Pachari was making stuff up and also getting money out of all this. Uh, you've got the fact that openly Obama's giving waivers to GE and others to shut down their competition. I mean, this is really becoming transparent to people. Uh, and now, 
we see these moves to engage in authoritarianism uh, to try to shut people down. Uh, it's uh, very, very frustrating. I mean, there was that female professor, I forget her name now, who was saying that uh, Obama, just ignore what people want. You've got other professors in the London Guardian saying, hey, let's have green fascism. We barely criticized her, you and I. What's her name, guys? And yeah, 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 Norgard. She had our video shut down on YouTube. I filed a bunch of stuff and got it back up. But now YouTube doesn't even let you file. They just say, well, we found it's bad. And all we did was show her writings, and then she took them down. And then we found other sites at another university where she said even more stuff. I mean, I can't even show you what she wrote publicly. I mean, it's, it's just insane. The fact is they cannot debate us. No, they can't. In fact, let's go with Michael Mann, by the way. The lawyer's name is John B. Williams of Cozen O'Connor, and this is the law firm that represented Joe Campbell in the tobacco lawsuits. Now, what's interesting is another skeptical scientist, Timothy Ball in Canada, was recently sued as well. And as long as I believe it was the Canadian Free Press was threatened the lawsuit for publishing articles skeptical of global warming. And here's the thing. On Michael Mann's case, I, I did a huge, long, detailed, probably thousands of words on a 5,000-word rebuttal to Michael Mann's claims. Michael Mann's, one of his key claims to, to being uh, essentially clean ethically is that Penn State University did an investigation by him, on him, and cleared him. By the same man, Spurrier, who did an investigation on Sandusky and cleared him years earlier. Uh, and so there's, not, there's no connection between Mann and Sandusky, except that the same university cleared them. And this was, a, this was an investigation that was called Hard to come up with a bigger mockery or a uh, you know anything that could be seen uh, as more transparent, uh, more um, a mockery than any investigation. I mean, this was a, the, the university investigating itself. Didn't ask any of the right people. Didn't ask any of the right questions. But Michael Mann will go around and tout this as some kind of proof that he had been cleared. Keep in mind, one of Michael Mann's own UN IPCC, the climate panel of the United Nations scientist, a man named Edward Zarita, has called for Michael Mann to be banned from the UN climate process based on his view that Michael Mann doesn't have the ethics to, to uh, continue there. So Michael Mann's own colleagues don't want anything to do with him. And we also have the, the email evidence that when Phil Jones asked Michael Mann to, to delete emails and tell other people to delete emails, Michael Mann Basically, if you look at the emails, it's very clear that he, he passed on that request and may have deleted the emails himself. So here we have him essentially uh, obstructing the Freedom of Information Act uh, process. Michael Mann is heavily involved uh, in that if you look at the email. So it's one of those things where Michael Mann is huffing and puffing. Uh, he has still not filed suit. But it does have a chilling effect, and this is what they're hoping. They bring in the big, expensive lawyers. They go after the big uh, big names and some of the little names, and the idea is they're making everyone think twice. They're, it's, a, it's an atmosphere of intimidation. And but Australia that's going to backfire. You put this stuff on uh, in front of a jury, and then you're going to be facing, uh, just like has happened to a lot of other groups, you're going to be facing the attorney's fees and damages. I mean, the courts, uh, the courts aren't perfect. But I found the courts do not like lawsuits trying to shut down free speech, especially of public figures. Now, it, you know, if it's some little old lady and you say something about her, you're in trouble. But when somebody's a public figure and uh, you've got all these emails out there, well, I mean, let's break down just briefly, and then I want to get to other news. Let's break down briefly the, oh, the problem with the hockey stick. I mean, it's like Al Gore saying polar bears can't swim uh, or Al Gore saying that carbon dioxide goes up and then heat goes up, but all the universities do the ice cores, it's the opposite. I mean, they've just got a problem here. I mean, everyone I know, including the Democrats, knows that Al Gore is a piece of garbage joke. I mean, Al Gore is a absolute fraud, and I'll say it. He didn't invent the Internet. I mean, I just can't believe what a joke this guy is. Yeah, and by the way, Al Gore's producer, Lori David, wrote a children's book for scholastic books that was for children's books across the country and actually reversed that CO2 temperature chart and had CO2 rising before temperature, exact opposite of what the charts show. And they, and they were later called on it by a skeptical scientist, and they ended up saying, oh, oops, it was a typo. Very hard to believe. This went out in all the first editions of the book. I'm not even sure they had a second edition. And this, uh, you know, this draft was actually reversed. And in the film... Al Gore presented that without identifying which was which. He said there's a close relationship. He didn't identify that CO2 
uh, uh, sorry, the temperature lead CO2. But back to Michael Mann. Well, yeah, I mean, he had them, he, he had them together, and, and then I was conflating that with the book where they had them backwards. You're right. They had them together, correct? But, 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 but really, it's heat and then carbon dioxide. Yes. And on Michael Mann's claim, Michael Mann's entire claim to fame is he looked at northern hemisphere temperatures from 1000 AD to the 20th century, and he claimed the temperatures were relatively stable until a, a big hockey stick, a big jump. So it looks like a hockey stick blade with the blade up in the but air. But he didn't look at the, uh, the, the Bronze Age. He didn't look at the Hiberian Maxim. He didn't look at all the other spikes before that. No, but even if you look at what he looked at, his science doesn't hold up. One fellow scientist uh, named Hans von Storch in Germany called it statistical rubbish. Steve McIntyre of Climate Audit, a statistician, tore it apart and said basically the way man had his temperature proxy, almost any numbers you fed into it would create a hockey stick. It was preconceived science. And since that time, we have had, and I, this is what I document on Climate Depot in this huge report, Study after study of both the Northern Hemisphere, the Southern Hemisphere, ocean temperatures, Europe, Switzerland, uh, uh, Antarctica have shown that there was a prominent warming period that was as warm or warmer, the medieval warm period from 900 to 1300 AD, and we had a very cold period, the Little Ice Age, that, that came up until about 1850. So the idea that temperatures were stable is completely out. His work Michael Mann's work has been demolished in the peer-reviewed literature. And what you'll hear constantly back is, well, we've had all these other independent people verify. No, most of the people are, are the other authors who Michael Mann, all of his fellow reviewers, it's this small clique of scientists using very similar data, all reinforcing each other's conclusion. But when it's looked at independently, it's statistical rubbish. And then when you look at the actual temperatures over the last thousand years, from many, I think it was 700 scientists and 40 institutions have looked at this, and there's absolutely was a medieval warm period. There absolutely was a little ice age. And a claim, and there's a new study just came out in the journal Nature that said the Roman warming period and the medieval warming period were likely warmer than temperatures today. Sure, that's why there was now, grapes growing in Scotland, and they haven't grown there in thousands of years. But going back here, my issue is for years watching Al Gore in front of Congress saying there is a consensus, no scientists disagree, and it was just a total fraud. I mean, it's, but let's say global warming was real. How does shutting down our power plants and getting rid of our cars and letting little hippie inspectors in our houses to control our lives, how does that help anything when China, India, Mexico, and 160 other plus countries are exempt and our jobs have already left the country. I mean, you know, California's imploding. They put a 20% carbon tax on them. I mean, I mean, they admit they want a post-industrial world. They're Malthusians, uh, people like Maurice Strong. I mean, really, these people are megalomaniacs. And uh, all we've got to do is point out they're the ones shutting the economy down. I mean, I'm ranting, but... No, and it's exactly right. We have people like John Holdren, Obama's science advisor, who said that cheap energy is one of the hazards of a free society. Uh, we have people like uh, Secretary Chu, who actually thinks uh, that that we can we'll know the energy mix of the world a hundred years from now. He's basically a killer, and he's claiming uh, you know they they all claim people like Barbara Boxer claim that acts of Congress in the United Nations can control the weather. We had President Obama in 2008 after he, the night of his election, I believe. Uh, came out and said his, his, his will be the administration that slows the rise of the oceans and heals the planet. They actually believe that we can control sea level, that we can control floods, droughts, hurricanes. This is no, now akin to medieval witchcraft. They actually talk about this openly. Even people like Senator Lieberman thinks Congress needs to address extreme weather, which is showing no trends. And if anything, we're not, we're, the trends are declining, whether you're talking about hurricanes. Well, that's, that's my next point, is that is that they blame... I mean, obviously, there's thousands of different climates and microclimates on the planet. There's always extreme weather somewhere. And they've also, these groups have been caught putting, putting the thermometers on the tarmac or, uh, or, or manipulating buoy data. I, I mean, it's a cornucopia of, uh, you know, shenanigans that are happening here. But what about hearing this is the hottest summer on record? I remember growing up hearing about crops getting parched. I remember growing up in two a days in football when it was 116 degrees and they had to cancel them in Dallas. I haven't been seeing 116 days. I mean, they'll call, we've had 30 days of 100 degrees. When I was a kid, it'd be, it'd be 30 days of 107. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I just, 
But, but what does giving Al Gore all my money do, even if, it, I mean, and of course, the U.N. voted and said the sun isn't what's doing it, too, so. Yeah, the U.N.'s not chartered to look at anything. They look at CO2, and they try to exclude natural causes. That's what they do. But in terms of this hottest, hottest July on record, here, this, is, this tells you the complete vapidity, how vapid this entire global warming movement is. They're desperate. And what they've reduced this to is they basically said many bad things will happen with global warming. And now they've set about setting up, finding bad things that will happen. This is akin to a, literally going to a palm reader or a fortune teller, and they say bad things. Well, guess what? Anything in your life where there's always going to be bad things that happen, you're going to now say, aha, they were right. So there, there's record keeping like we've never had before. We can detect tornadoes and hurricanes like we've never been able to before with Doppler radar, with satellites. We can detect all this stuff so we can have much higher reporting of events. And now anything bad that happens, they say, aha, we predicted it. No, here's the bottom line with July being the hottest year, hottest temperature. If you go back to the 1930s, particularly 1936, state by state records that the thermometer stations that existed then that still exist now, in other words, not comparing it to the thermometers that were later put online in the 50s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and you go back and compare, there's not only is the 1930s warmer, but it's much warmer. In fact, the state records were massive amounts of state records were broken in the 1930s that still stand today. The reason they get a quote hottest July on record, they homogenize the data. They start adding their formula. They start putting in different adjustments that make the average warmer. But if you go back and look at the actual numbers by the stations that were in existence then and now, it is no contest. We've had scientists come out now and trying to explain this, but it's all politics. They're claiming something. And here's the most absurd part of all. The United States, the continental U.S. is all they were talking about. 1.6% of the Earth's surface, and they're trying to draw global trends from that. At the same time July was having that, the state of Alaska was having record cold. What they're calling it the year without a summer. And I, I don't know the exact comparison. Alaska might be about two-thirds the size of the continental U.S. At the same time, South Africa was having record cold. Australia, record cold in their southern hemisphere winters. They weren't saying, well, that, let's look at that and say, well, that could be an extrapolation of global cooling. It made just as much sense. They pulled out 1.6% of the Earth's surface with data that had been monkeyed around with, with adjustments on the uh, homogenized to their averages. And they tried to claim it was the hottest July on record. Well, let's expand on that, though. I mean, they do this every summer, saying it's the end of the world. Al Gore comes crawling out of whatever massage parlor he's in and, you know, you know pushes all this stuff. But, I mean, I've seen them say the polar bears are dying. We've got to list them as endangered. But then mainline government statistics say in northern Europe and, 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 and northern Russia, it's five-fold increase since the 1950s. And it's a fourfold increase in North America. I mean, this—I mean, they're they're running around everywhere. I mean, they just think we're idiots. I, I, I mean, yes. In fact, the polar bears, and I, and I have a whole A to Z report. The polar bears as a microcosm of the entire debate. They're absolutely at or near historic population highs. They're showing no signs of distress. They're actually, by all accounts, like the wildlife biologists in Canada are saying they're doing absolutely fine. Well, have you seen the numbers of five times as many as there were in the 50s? Yes, five times as there were. The, of the best estimates in the 1950s and 60s were that higher. And what did it was a hunting regulation. They were allowing a lot of uh, overhunting of the species, and that's why the numbers went down way back, and then they've corrected that. There's absolutely nothing. And if you look at this here, I just had an article today by a zoologist, a PhD. Her name, her name is Susan Crockford who went through and was just realizing and explaining now that when they listed the polar bears as an endangered species, I think they're threatened, not on the endangered species list, listed as threatened, uh, they're actually, they didn't even supply the right data for the offshore sea ice that they were using to have their dens in. In other words, they perfectly, I don't want to say purposely, but they omitted this information. In other words, polar bears don't need all that ice anyway to thrive. They just move on land. And they've also survived many periods much warmer than we're even contemplating by the global warming models, which, by the way, violate the basic principles of forecasting, according to forecast experts. And that brings us to the next topic, if you don't mind, the Arctic. Just this past two weeks, they've been claiming the Arctic is at a record sea ice low. This is utter nonsense. What they've done is they put up satellites in the Arctic in 1979. Remember the 1970s? The global cooling scare. The CIA, the National Academy of Sciences, some of the same scientists, people like Stephen Snyder and others who were worried, warning of man-made global cooling in the 70s, 
we're, we're, we're now war warning of uh, man-made global warming. Stephen Snyder's now dead. But they are claiming uh, that the Arctic is at some kind of record low. And it is at a low of the satellite era, but that's because we put the satellites up at a high point of Arctic ice, probably a 40-year cooling trend. Uh, and it, but if you go back to the 1930s and 40s, Greenland has actually cooled since that time. The Arctic was as warm or warmer, and it's very likely we had similar amounts of ice in the 1930s. Sure, but I mean, just a couple years ago, they said it was all going to be melted, and they had a record yeah. come. But, but I mean, he, look, look, I want to explain this to new viewers and, and school children who literally are brought to tears being told polar bears can't swim. I've seen the Arctic in the north and the Antarctic in the south. And of course, the summers and winters are reversed there, if, 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 if memory serves. I'm no climatologist, but I've interviewed dozens. And I've seen them show a 10-year composite a few years ago. I know you've probably seen this, where it shows the Arctic and Antarctic in their summer and winters. And that's why you have to have icebreakers come in, you know, in the spring and summer to open up the the summer and winter passages. Yeah. But, but, but I mean, what happens is, is to show people on TV, if, if they'll put the camera up here for just a moment is that you know in the summer it shrinks in the winter it expands but they always lie in the summer and show it collapsing and go look at how fast it's receding of course they yes. know full well it does that in the summer and then does this in the winter i mean it is just it, it is just the, they play on the scientific ignorance now now you're the real expert because you live this am, am i correct you're absolutely right and what they've done and when you hear ice free arctic or record low people think the arctic ice cap disappearing they are talking about literally a few weeks at the end of August and into September when they talk about the record low sea ice extent. And this is nonsense, uh, first, for many reasons, because it's only a few weeks. The idea in 2008, there are many predictions of the ice-free Arctic by 2012. We're not even close. I think it's more than the area of Texas and larger, plus, I want to say, another state, several other states, even now with their, quote, record low. And not all the monitors are agreeing. Some monitors are showing the ice is still above uh, 2007's low. But this is a game they're playing because at the same time, Antarctic ice, the southern hemisphere, has been at or near record 30-year highs since they put satellite monitoring there. But they won't talk about the Antarctic. In fact, they'll come out with studies saying, well, the Antarctic, we actually expect more snow down there. But the Antarctic, the, the main body of the Antarctic, Antarctic and the southern hemisphere is cooling since the 1970s. And what they've done and what Al Gore has done, he had a trip down to Antarctica a few months ago. They went to the Antarctic Peninsula on the western end, which is this tiny little thing that juts up uh, in the west and the north. And they focus on the warming on that little peninsula and they ignore the vast body that's been cooling and gaining ice. It's just the idea, like you said, they find the area and cherry pick it. And try well, I mean, to look, with Al Gore, I mean, it's a proven fact. It's certified fraud. I mean, he is just an absolute scam artist. And I challenge, I challenge Al Gore to come after me. I mean, Al Gore is a joke. He is, he has totally lost effectiveness because he's a partisan political figure. And trying to put this on a face like this, people, and in fact, he still actually was a, a global warming uh, activist who actually had a very good analysis. The way you sell science to the public is not to try to go through the minutia of the science. They believe people they trust. And the problem is Al Gore is not going to be trusted by a minimum of half Well, that's the my next question. They've totally lost trust across the they board. People put Obama in because they'd lost trust in Republicans. Now they're putting Romney in. You know, just desperately change, change. But they don't understand the same power structure. The reason Obama and Romney are so close together is because they represent pretty much the same special monopoly interest across the board. I want your take on that if you agree or disagree. And well, yeah, what do you expect out of Romney? Well, first of all, I was really saddened when you look at someone like Paul Ryan, who seems so good on so many points. But when push came to shove, he supported the bank bailout. He was in GOP leadership. If I'm not mistaken, the majority of Republican congressmen opposed the 2008 bank bailout. Yeah, they did. Paul, yeah, but Paul Ryan supported it because he was in Republican leadership. To me, that says when push comes to shove, Paul Ryan supports the establishment and the status quo. And that, to me, is such a uh, – I, I work for Senator Inhofe, and he called it the most egregious vote in the history of the Senate. That is such a bellwether vote for anyone that's to, as a gut check, because it's easy to oppose Obama's budgets and Obama's policies on partisan grounds. It's easy to go along uh, with your own party's president. It's hard to buck your own president. And Paul Ryan, at his moment of gut check in 2008, caved in and supported the bank bailout. So that was really a big disappointment there. I can't remember Romney wasn't in office. I think Romney 
claims to have been opposed to the bank bailout. No, no, he was for it. He was for it. I can't remember. Is that correct? Okay, no, no, no. He it. promoted it, and they and okay. and and, and Paul right. Ryan supported No Child Left Behind, all the rest of it. Okay, so what happens is is that they all. If you forget those little points, people say, "Oh, you're focusing on one thing." Well, it's like in a marriage. It's one thing if your husband doesn't come home and bring you flowers. It's another thing if he's a philanderer. Well, if you support the bank bail, it doesn't matter how good of a husband you were the rest of the time. That's the equivalent of cheating on your wife. And that's, it's not the equivalent, you know, voting for some budget here or there might be the equivalent of forgetting to get flowers on your anniversary. But to me, sure. that, that bank bailout vote tells me that they lack the ability to stand up to the Washington establishment. So that's why I don't expect any kind of radical change. I, I do think it would be an improvement, hopefully budget wise, and they can range. Sure. But I don't think anyone looking at this who thinks it's going to be the desocialization of America is putting way too much hope in these two gentlemen. Sure, look at uh, Hillary. She's not going to go to the Democratic convention. Uh, they're talking about Biden out of there. I'm seeing all the signs of a stampede exodus by the establishment, the cover of Newsweek, hit the road, Jack to Obama. What do you see happening in the election? Well, as of right now, and things change, the thing is Romney's such a stable and talented debater, stable candidate. I don't expect him to have any major goof-offs or any kind of problems. So given that, I would say that Romney is going to pretty much win this, not not easily, but win it with a, by a few points, and he'll get some of the key swing states, maybe Virginia, Wisconsin, Florida. I just don't see Obama carrying like he did. Obama, the, the, literally the, 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 the floor has been ripped out beneath him. He doesn't have um, that that uh, aura anymore of hope and change to, to that swing voter who's just all enamored with him, the first black president, the whole aura that surrounded him. So I don't think he can win with that. Uh, and I just think given the economic situation, um, I think th that... Uh, I agree, but they could start a war to get people to rally around. They could do a lot of things. To do that. Yes, that's always possible. And I actually like Clint Eastwood's speech, by the way, to, to give it a plug. It was so refreshing to have something different. It was a little bit meandering, but I think everyone's into this whole thing where everything's got to be so nice and polished. I think Clint Eastwood, I thought that was a great... Well, great let me be clear on, on that. The Republicans, it's one thing to clap. They were shouting and talking and yelling at him, and he wasn't using a teleprompter. And I'm a great you know, speaker in public. I'm you know, better than on air because I do it so much. I even forget I'm on air sometimes. So it's like I'm sitting around the you know, uh, uh, kitchen table, start babbling. But... If people, while you're trying to give a speech, are like, hey, say there, hey, Clint. I mean, they were right there yelling while he was trying to do a really nice piece. So so I can't blame him for a little bit of meandering and things. But the fact is, you could tell there was no teleprompter there. He was looking down at a few notes. And I thought overall it was a maverick type uh, speech. But the fact that somebody like Clint Eastwood who doesn't usually get involved in politics is showing up, shows how concerned people are. And that's what's sad, is people think Romney's going to deliver them. I got news. He supported the carbon taxes, but I noticed on ClimateDepot.com, it's refreshing. He did have a little smart mouth comment at Obama saying he'll control sea levels, uh, which, again, sea levels aren't rising. Last time I checked uh, Google sea levels. Uh, but uh, uh, break that down. Yeah, there's no. Ex there was actually a drop for the the first two years after Obama was in, and there's now there's been a resumption. We've been sea levels have been rising since the end of the last ice age, but there's been no acceleration in sea level. There's absolutely nothing going on. The only scary thing about sea levels are these ridiculous models showing, you know, based that everything's going to melt and all the sea ice, uh, land-based ice is going to melt. We're going to have all this sea level. It's just not happening. And there's and I can I have all, I have, um, the Danish, not the Danish, but the. Uh, um, uh, the, the European uh, Space Agency has been monitoring sea level, not showing this, and also uh, other other European-based agencies are looking at this, and the NASA satellites, of course, show the drops. There's nothing going on in sea level that's alarming. But what's interesting is the left's reaction to this. They said Romney was mocking, you know, global warming. Well, first of all, uh, if you look at the actual uh, you know, real estate development on the coast, people like Al Gore, by the way, isn't too far from the coastline, and many others who profess to be global warmers, they don't seem to be worried about their property. If people are so worried, wouldn't property values be dropping on the coastline? Well, I mean, some islands are, are uh, and sandbars are getting bigger, others are getting smaller. That's always yeah. a process of change, but I do see it as a major victory that Romney's been forced to go from pushing global warming carbon taxes, which I know Bain would love, to get a little piece of the action on derivative-wise, to now making jokes about it. So in closing, 
What do you expect them to do outside of slap suits, threats, uh, shutting down videos, trying to burn digital books? Outside of that call for authoritarianism, I think that's going to be the nail in their coffin now. This authoritarian attack, I think, is really going to turn the public from not liking them to really hating them. Uh, a, do you agree with that, Mark Moreno? Or yeah, B, I mean, I, what are the other attacks? I think it backfired, but I will say this. Um, right now, the global warming movement is having a bit of a renaissance, and here's what I mean. They've, they've, they've been taking a beating for years, and now they have the Arctic ice, which again is a 30-year low based on satellite data, and they're now claiming, well, we have other measurements which show that this is unprecedented over 100 years. And we have scientists like Tim Ball and the Canadian in Canada who studied this, and all these, they're now claiming they have great records going back 100 years. It's not the case at all. These are piecemeal. They had old ship records. But the bottom line is nothing unprecedented in the Arctic, but they're using that. They're using a guy named Richard Muller, a Berkeley scientist who never was a skeptic, is now claiming he was a skeptic, a converted skeptic. They're ignoring people like uh, James Lovelock in the U.K. and German scientists who reversed themselves this year, uh, you know, the, the, from global warming believers, the skeptics. But they're using oh. – they're using this stuff, and they have a weak candidate in Romney. I fully expect if a debate global warming comes up, Romney is going to back down on the science and not not challenge it. And well, I yeah, there's so much money on this. In fact, you just said something key. I'm seeing this across the board now. They will have people who were never skeptics on any issue claim, oh, I woke up, I recant. Yeah, it's almost like when the church would torture somebody to say they were a witch or something. That's the new proof of it. Uh, th that's their new PR stunt I've been noticing. Yeah, it's orchestrated propaganda. I mean, it's pure and simple. And even some of the global warming people admit that, but then they also admit that it's important for propaganda purposes to have someone like one Richard Muller. And it's just, it's silly because I have a list of people, scientists who reverse from the other side. Again, I just, uh, I, I a man from Germany this year, Franz and, um, Verhoen, and also James sure. Lovelock, the UK. It just you know, outnumbered. It actually did a report uh, mocking the idea that the media was so excited about one scientist. But you got the Arctic ice, you got this, and you got the extreme storms. What they've done now, and I don't know the effect yet on the public, but any time it's a bad storm, again, bad things will happen with global warming. Well, guess what? Bad things are happening. Oh, it must be global warming. So they're really pounding that. Oh, well, you see them when a dust storm blows in that's always happened. They say, hey, give the U.N. money. You know, they'll fix it. In, in closing here, I'm living under these people. I'm living under their oppression. I'm, I'm living under their taxation. Uh, you know, where the mayor says, you're going to pay more power, it's for the earth. Well, no, it's for insiders to make double the money selling me less power for more. I mean, it's outrageous. And to watch poor people, get, you know, getting hurt the worst by these Malthusian scumbags makes me very angry. I am seeing a huge pushback locally, though, against Agenda 21. Uh, what do you expect him to do there? Because, I mean, they are hitting the panic button, as you've seen in the news, going, oh, my God, they're waking up to our takeover. What do you expect to happen there? Because the real battle I see is at the local level. Yes, well, I think a lot of this right now, if Obama is reelected and the EPA is basically unleashed in a second term, we already have the head of the EPA at UN planning meetings to talk about Agenda 21. This is going to be coming down, trickling through every local community at a much more um, uh, you know, robust way than it has in the past. Because they know they're they know they need to start acting. If they can't do it in an Obama second term, they're not they're not going to be able to do it. Um, you know, for a long time to come. This is one of their best opportunities. So what they're going to they're going to try to do. They're going to try to do heavy regulation through the EPA. They're going to shut down coal plants. We didn't get a chance to talk about it, but they're already taken away. The American SUV is now dead statutorily, according to the federal books. Obama just raised the, the uh, EPA gas mileage standards beyond anything that an EPA could ever hope to, to a company. And this is going to be this is going to be again. This was a this was a shot fire without the public even having any clue this is going on. And it's going to get worse and worse as we go forward with these kind of things happening. The new standards, by the way, by 2025, 54 miles per gallon is what the uh, fuel efficiency standard is going to be set by the EPA. And we're going to all be driving around little tiny electric cars, which are death boxes, because as you reduce the weight of cars, you increase the fatalities and the injury rate. And well, let me expand on that. And it phases yeah. in, but as you said, within just a few years, most SUVs, and I've got three children, my wife, I'm going somewhere. I fill the car up. I mean, 
around here, the environmental cultists who could care less about the environment drive these little bitty tiny cars and they will attack your SUV, they'll stab the tires, they'll knock your windows out. They brag about it. You know, I mean, it's not as bad as Colorado where they set fires and burn down ski resorts, but they are just these horrible little demons. And I've got the article actually right here that, uh, that uh, you were mentioning. EPA issues new fuel efficiency standard. I, I mean, it, it's, it's they're shutting our country down because they hate wealth, they hate prosperity, and they want to teach us you're not going to build anything. It's all going to be out of a government job. I think that's what probably finally defeated Obama was that you didn't build that statement. Uh, so, Mark, you didn't build your website. You didn't get your college degree. Uh, you didn't have your family. In fact, your parents didn't conceive you. Government did. Uh, you were raised in a test tube, I guess, like Aldous Huxley wants you Don't to be. Don't laugh at that. Years ago, a few years ago, it was Popular Science Magazine. There's a movement that people are openly talking about people not being allowed to have children. And the quote was willy nilly. The idea is that given the overpopulation and our resource scarcity, that you're going to have to apply to the government uh, in order to have children. I mean, this is, you know, can you think of China? There's a reason Nancy Pelosi went to China to say that we need to complete inventory in every aspect of our lives. That movement's been afoot for, for years since Paul Ehrlich, who still wins awards, by the way, the author of The Population Bomb, the most discredited eugenicist scientist in the, in the country. But there's still a movement that people don't think you should be allowed to have kids like that, or certainly you should be. Well, there's not still a movement. They're all over the news. It's in cartoons. It's in. I mean, it's yeah. in TV. I mean, I agree with you. And who co-authored uh, the uh, 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 book Eco Science with him? None other than John P. Holdren, who oh, says, man. "Let's drug the water to sterilize people." I mean, these are just flaming control freak weirdos. And I was just watching a movie with my children. There's a there's some Disney film with Indians, a few years old. Can't remember the name at the moment, but Pocahontas. It was no, it wasn't it wasn't something that like, it was a lesser known movie. But the whole point of it was you can't portray modern you know, religion, Christianity, Judaism, anything in movies today, especially kids films. But somehow this Indian, this Disney film had all this Indian religion, mysticism, the earth, the winds, Gaia. And it was really promoting yeah, all this to children. Avatar, so, yeah, Avatar, that, Avatar is like Native Americans on a distant planet. I mean, they got the horses. Yeah. That's all it is. But you can never have that kind of promotion of Christianity, but it's okay when it's sort of a tribal, earth-centered uh, worship. That's what, that's what the kids are being taught. And there's nothing really wrong with the movie, but it definitely was promoting this form of spiritualism, mysticism, whatever you want to call it, to kids in very heavy ways. And it's all related uh, to the uh, essentially the, the earth worship, which is, again, why it's so amazing. I mentioned James Lovelock. He is the inventor, the founder, uh, the scientist who came up with Gaia, the idea that the Earth is a living, breathing organism, and from that, people came out with Mother Earth, and they worship the Earth. All sorts of things. It's amazing that this guy can't even swallow man-made global warming hysteria. He's also opposed to wind power. He calls wind power one of the greatest follies of the 21st century. Oh, well, because it's a scam. But, I mean, here's the issue. It's it, there's nothing wrong with caring about the Earth, the environment, all that. Yeah. They use the fake environmental movement, from my research, to avoid all the real environmental issues and, and, and real things that are going on out there, and that's what's so frustrating. And it's not just that it's a, it's a, this earth worship. All of it is teaching us that we're ugly. We're crap. Humans are a parasite. Parasite. Humans are scum. And I, for one, am sick of it. Well, that was an extensive interview with Mark Moreno of ClimateDepot.com. Thank you so much for spending time with us. I know thank you're you. a busy guy, and thank you for your courage of speaking out against these authoritarians. Thank you very much. No problem. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. There goes Mark Moreno, ladies and gentlemen. And that concludes this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. I'm going to tell you something, folks. We're winning the fight for hearts and minds. But the authoritarians run the bureaucracies. They run the governments. They run the system. And they want to shut us up with the Cybersecurity Act and with uh, all these threats of lawsuits and the rest of it. And the answer to these bullies is letting them know that we're not going to shut up. We don't just believe what we're saying is true. We do the research and we try to put out the most accurate info. Does that mean we've got everything right? No. But we know damn well that Al Gore has been deceiving people that polar bears can't swim. We know that paying him carbon taxes while shipping the jobs to China where they have no carbon restrictions is not helping us. All right, this is out of control. This is wrong. This is authoritarianism, and we are in danger. So be sure and support ClimateDepot.com and their sponsors, Infowars.com, 
PrisonPlanet.com, buy our books, videos, ProPure water filters discounted. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or other places, get a 15-day free trial or get a $5.95 a month membership at PrisonPlanet.tv. You get six memberships for the price of one. Uh, all of this is so important that you financially support those of us going head up against these tyrants. Okay? PrisonPlanet.tv. Lord willing, if they don't shut us down, we'll see you back here on Monday night and on the radio, 4 to 6 Sunday, and of course the weekday show. God bless you all, all of you that care about liberty. Let's stand together against these tyrants.